everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Cup Reviews, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your host and co-artistic producer here at Cup of Hemlock, Mackenzie, and today we are diving into one of the great theatrical plays, dramatic works of the American theater canon, and it's being hosted by the National Theater, the <laughs> British company, starring a bunch of British actors. This is the 2014 production that was on at the Young Vic, directed by Benedict Andrews, and it starred Gillian Anderson. That's right, Ms. Margaret Thatcher herself. What's her name from X-Files, which is going to be Eleanor Roosevelt in The First Ladies as Blanche Dubois. And then you have Vanessa Kirby, also from The Crown, also from Mission Impossible as uh, Stella. <laughs> and of course, then you have Ben Foster as Stanley Kowalski. So Ben Foster, great actor, done a crap ton of stuff. I remember first seeing him in X-Men when he played Angel in X-Men 3 back in the day. So he is, so once again, it's a star-studded cast of characters that we have here. So to kick us off, we have a whole bunch of returning faces to our panel. So first off, the gentleman who's been away from us the longest, Mr. Andrew Poiru. Hello, welcome back. Last time we saw you was on our pipeline review, which is yeah, all the way back around this time last year, if I'm not mistaken. It's been Has it been that long, years. really? Yeah, it's been quite a while. It's been quite, quite a while. So we're good to have you back. You've been off gallivanting the the, the virtual space, performing. Give us a little on what you've been up to, uh, what's in your cup today, and what is your ensemble? Is there a particular reason for the Superman shirt? Uh, particular, I'll start with, uh, last one first, uh, particular reason for the Superman shirt. I haven't worn it in a while. I'm like, I'm on the cuff. Let's, let's wear something that makes me feel awesome. So I'm wearing the Superman wow. shirt. Uh, what's in my cup? Uh, it's a drink called Sorrel. I, it's a drink in the West Indies and I mixed it with vodka. And, uh, what have I been up to? I've been doing a lot of virtual theater. I just finished a production of Clue. Uh, not long before that, it was a production of Troilus and Cressida. And then before that, uh, before that, I don't even remember what the last thing was before that, but doing a lot of virtual theater, producing, acting, directing, stuff like that. Doing it all. <laughs> doing it all. Trying, trying. <laughs> all right, right. And then, of course, we have coming back from our wonderful Top Girls panel, the wonderful Carly Billings. Welcome back for your, I think this is your third appearance. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. What a ding dang treat. Right? It's I so know. great to have you back. Like we've we've done an interview with you. We've now done Top Girls. We've done I there there's another one you've done with us too. I'm totally drawing a blank on it though. I think this is the third. This I think is this the third. Is the third. Okay. You okay. might be okay. thinking of it because when Patrick did theirs, they also mentioned me. Because Patrick and I uh intermingle a lot in our artistic. That's it. That's a good yes. Tip for that that yeah. is right. Can now yeah, okay. There we go. There we go. Love it. So, Carly, how have you been? What have you been up to since we last saw you a few weeks ago? Yeah, uh, I've been what's in your cup? good. I've been good. What's in my cup is uh, some classic H2O because I'm an H2 ho. So, <laughs> gotta ah. stay hydrated. Ah. Uh, what have I been up to? I've been up to a few different things. Just gearing up for the spring season. Uh, producing a few things locally here in Hamilton where I am based. But, uh, also working on some development things behind the scenes with Patrick for our theater company, Afterlife Theater. Ooh. And uh, yeah, so just uh, all around lots of Zoom meetings right now. Lots of emailing. Yeah. Love it. Wonderful. And of course, we have the academic himself, the wonderful Mr. Patrick Teed, who we saw last in our special holiday episode, all about the Christmas truce, where we talked all about the road to Tipperary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh, now I'm just thinking about that show. That show was also incredible. Um, but um, yeah, no, I'm great. Um, I'm I'm also drinking water, but not because I'm an H2O, but because I ate an entire thing of sour keys before I uh, showed up here. And then I was like, wow, I'm dehydrated. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm drinking water. Um, what have I, have I been up to? Um, academically, my dissertation proposal, hence the entire thing of sour keys as I've been working on that. Um, and then, yeah, uh, arts wise, I think the most exciting thing is, yeah, trying to figure out, um, blocking off time for Carly and I to do a writing retreat for a play that we got some money to write. So Ooh. hopefully we'll get to hear more about that soon ish. But yeah. Can't wait. 
can't wait. Can't wait. And tonight, in honor of all the Coca-Cola that gets talked about in the episode, I'm drinking a Diet Coke from a Coke glass. As that's well, smart. So, yeah. So, Appropriate. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, well, I mean, let's get into this piece. I mean, right off the top, this is a piece that features heavily Jillian Anderson, who played Blanche Dubois. She notably won an a, uh, Olivier Award for this performance, so clearly critically acclaimed. So let's give our thoughts. Did she earn the critical acclaim that she was given? Patrick, I'll let you start this one. Oh, uh, yes, I love starting questions that I suspect there'll be mostly a uh, consensus on. Because <laughs> it's like, yes, I get to be the original one. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, her performance was incredible. You know, I like to be a contrarian a lot of the time, you know, and especially obviously when you see a kind of, you're seeing a performance that is so acclaimed, has literally like received prestigious awards. You kind of come, you can come in, or at least I can come in hypercritical of everything it is they're doing and every single choice I kind of want to assess and scrutinize. But I felt like she, Jillian Anderson did such an incredible job at fleshing out the complexity of Blanche, which I think is such a, an actual hard ask, especially for the first half of the play where Blanche is like all affectation and doesn't show her cards. Um, But like Anderson's performance, really, she, she showed you the layers underneath every affected choice she's making. And then, and then that, that obviously makes the unraveling in the second act so earned and so incredibly performed. Um, yeah, every every small choice she made, I was just like, you're a genius. This is a master class. Um, I'm honored to watch you. Yeah, incredible. Love that. Love that. Carly, are you piggybacking or, or, or are, you, are you contrarian? I'm going to piggyback. I'm going to yes and the heck out of that because to me, I like I hardly have the words to describe how brilliant a Blanche I think Jillian Anderson is. Um, I think she's so nuanced. I think she's so clear through that nuance, which is a really tough thing for Blanche. Um, I think a lot of times Blanche can get kind of covered up in the like feathers and furs of it all. Um, uh-huh. but Jillian does the opposite of that. She doesn't. She like, oh my gosh, she just gets to it, and she truly. As she's going through it, like, can she's so delusionally wonderful that she like believes what she's saying, and also the audience believes it. Like she mm-hmm. like, because there's a difference between like, look at my airy weirdness, and like she plays like a weirdly grounded Blanche, which mm-hmm. is like, I don't understand how she does it because it's yeah, it's truly a masterclass. Yeah, Patrick, you put the words out of my mouth. Her Blanche is so self-assured, but sometimes I have to remind myself that she's lying. She's making yeah. it, she's fabricating For things. Real. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. She she's built this like world so clearly that it it yeah. isn't a lie. Yeah, it yeah. is the truth, and that here is some truth, and yeah. it's not, but it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, uh, I'm I'm gonna be slightly contrarian. Uh, mm-hmm. It took me a while to actually warm up to Anderson's performances because. Uh, her performance because like at the top I came in with that exact mindset of the contrary and I was like oh, I don't know I don't know if I like this I like and then as the performance got further and further I got lost in the character and as more revelations started coming out through the through the plot I was like oh everything everything that happened before makes sense now and I started to see how that character was built and how and why the choices were made and i and then eventually i was like yeah okay you 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 get the olivier i understand now you are dead i'm sorry <laughs> but yeah it was uh carly i i have to agree it was a, an incredibly grounded character for how blanche is written and i think that's what i ended up appreciating about it is because i could see how it could just get away from uh from a person from a performer but it really, I found Anderson really kept it to a certain level where you saw all those layers, you saw the thought process, and you saw a person behind this, all the fabrications and all the lies. Yeah, I I, I ended up really, really loving her performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm going to play Slight Contrarian as well. So I really did like this. I liked how much she was willing to make this character annoying and unlikable at times, as well as she she, she went full Julia Louis-Dreyfus where she just w- threw herself into the net, like making herself look ugly, like just 
the smeared makeup, the ratted hair by the end. Like, it takes somebody who's really confident in themselves to be willing to be seen and filmed looking as unappealing as she does by the end. And that is something that very few actresses I find go for to such an extreme. Like, Julian Anderson does. Like, she is such a chameleon with her performances. I mean, you watch this compared to her Margaret Thatcher in The Crown compared to what we've already seen of her as Eleanor Roosevelt in this upcoming series. Like, it's just... Or even her on The X-Files. Each of those characters are so distinct. She really does morph herself into these. And it's just a masterclass to watch her go. Now, I will say one thing I did find a little bit annoying was the accent and character voice she put on. And that, for me, I was like, it's going to a bit of an extreme where it's becoming grating and overly theatrical. Kind of like how a British person would think an American Southerner would sound. It almost cross-landed into Blanche Devereaux from the Golden Girls, which is funny because that character was based on Blanche Dubois and her character description in the script originally was she is more Southern. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Blanche. De yeah, yeah. So she is more Southern than Blanche Dubois. So that's what Rue McClanahan based her character on. So her accent came from that extreme Southernness, the point where it was caricature. And her accent at times, I was like, hey, this is getting really annoying. Like, this doesn't feel authentic. As much as I was like amazed that that was her voice and for this, so she like, once again, look at her voice as Margaret Thatcher compared to this. Totally different tone and voice. I was like, okay, this is starting to get really annoying at times where I'm just like, okay, I'm ready. I can see why Stanley is like, getting frustrated having you in his house if he has to listen to that day after day after day i'd be like okay this story get on my nerves as well so can i piggyback off you yes. really quick by just saying in my notes i'm like i like julian anderson but the character gets more grating 45 minutes in <laughs> like, yep. like, like it absolutely agree the accent became got to a point where i'm like okay i could you can change that now yeah yeah. I, I want to piggyback on this too, but actually the reverse, because this oh. is the second time I watched it. I watched this, um, I want to say like three months ago. And the and the accent was the first thing I had to actually get myself to accept, uh, to accept the characterization. Yeah. Um, because I also was I I was I was annoyed actually off the bat the first time I watched it by the accent. <laughs> um, but then like I mean, in part, obviously, the consistency of the characterization of that accent, as kind of absurd as it is at some points, I think helped me like get into it and especially already accepted at the beginning of this one. But also, I feel like for Blanche, who is so overly affected, like the kind of strange, it's like Moira Rose, like the Moira Rose lightness yes. of it, like actually works for me for this character because she's never showing or always trying to hide her true face, right? Yes. So everything is performed. And like when you know people that, are like that they they have weird fucking accents <laughs> like um people that yes. are just constantly like performing in order to like appease people and like this second time watching when i no longer had to like get easing into the oddity of it i really appreciated actually this kind mm. of like the strangeness yeah. of her manner of speech yeah i'll just jump in real quick too patrick i i felt the way you felt actually even though i only saw it once i her accent was the thing that got me into like, oh, she's doing a thing. Oh, oh, she's still, oh, she's still doing it. Oh, she believes the thing she's doing. Oh, oh, she's really going for it. Okay. Um, and it is that like Moira Rose, David, like very like it's who, <laughs> oh, who she is. Thank you. And I was obsessed and am obsessed, and I hate it, but I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, once again, like it fit Blanche's theatricality of her character. But after three hours of that voice, I was like, okay, drag her off. Let's go. Let's, let's wrap it up. Her wailing on the floor at the end. I got no, uh, I, I can almost supposed to feel sympathy for her in this one, but I'm also like, okay, <laughs> out we go. We're done. We're done for the night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jillian Anderson. I love you dearly, but three it's hours of that cold voice. take it. I appreciate it. <laughs> right? Like, oh my God, Blanche. I know. It's so yeah. concerned. <laughs> Ship her off. <laughs> Take her that accent, that's enough <laughs> don't be wrong fantastic performance thoroughly deserved that award it, it reminded me of Imelda Staunton when she did Gypsy where she comes in at a 9 and somehow by the end is able to ratchet it up to a 10 and not feel forced so mm. overall it was a solid performance it's just the accent threw me for a bit there where I was like ooh what is with this accent so yeah 
All right, next section, which is which other member of the cast stood out to you? And Andrew, I'll let you start this one. Ooh, I have to go with Ben Foster. That 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 was it was just from the get-go. I was really, really drawn in by his performance and his character. And um he took me for a ride where I think I I, I hopped in on Patrick and Carly. Uh I think Carly would said it's like, I want to love you, but I hate you and I can't appreciate this. And that was exactly how like I I'm so happy you said that because I was like, oh thank goodness. Cause I'm like, I don't know if I should, I don't know if I should like Stanley. But like, there's part of me that like can't help it, and I thought Ben Foster was really good at like pulling me into this. Like, I'm there. There are reasons behind what I'm doing, but also being really uh, disgusting enough as a character to to really like go. Okay, I can't. I can't accept you as as a full picture, but there are still aspects of you that I appreciate. So because of that, and like like you said, it's a stellar cast and everyone did a fantastic job, but just that ride that Ben Foster was able to take me on and leave me with this kind of like inner conflict, I have to kind of say like that that really stood out for me and that it's, it takes a kind of actor to really make a performance that an audience almost can't decide on in a good way. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I got I to gotta give it to Ben Foster in this one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have other I, I have opposite thoughts on Ben Foster, so I will save my thoughts for weakest element. So we will oh. come back to this topic. Wow. Okay. So I'm putting a pin in that. Carly, what is your cash shout out? Sure. So I too uh, am obsessed with Ben Foster in this role. I won't go on too long about him. But I really from the from the top, the person who just got me in it was Claire Burt as Eunice. I just was like, I know where we are. I know who we're dealing with. She was lovely. I felt so sad for her. I wanted to watch a play about her. I mean, we weren't, but I was like, maybe that's something that could be cool. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I there's not much to say about her because she doesn't have a lot to do, but I thought she was lovely. Um, But Ben Foster for me killed it as Stanley. Stanley stare just like made me scared in every way. Um, But I also, yeah, uh, like Andrew was saying, I... I like love him, but I have to remind myself that I hate him. Like I just like it was very he's the kind of man who you're walking on the street, you look at him, you go, Oh, look at that man. Oh, I have to cross the street now and be near that man. I'm gonna not do that. And I'm gonna keep on staying on my side of the street as I walk home at night. Or like he's the kind of man who starts to walk towards you on your side of the street and you cross the street to avoid. Mm-hmm. Like it was very clearly that. Mm-hmm. And I think he like perfectly encapsulated that like mm-hmm. Stanleyness. Mm-hmm. Of, of that yeah love that love that patrick i feel like like I, I have to repeat at this point um like i could make a case for lachelle carl's haunting walk across the stage selling flowers for the dead but you know like because that yeah it was that was, that, was a, that was a moment that yeah. was haunting I, that's a perfect word that for was that. absolutely um, haunting yes an incredible three minute performance um so yeah I'll, I'll do that little shout out but yeah for me the big the performance that really stood out for me outside of Jillian Anderson's was also Ben Foster's Stanley. I, you know, start, I think Stanley is such an interesting character because obviously we go in knowing that he's incredibly abusive, incredibly violent, incredibly sexually violent. I mean, we go in, I mean, if you know the play, you go in knowing that. And if yeah. you don't know that, you've figured this out quite quickly. Um, and so he's in so many ways, this like irredeemable character. And we have all these like associations for Stanley, especially like Marlon Brando Stanley, who's just like this like nonstop, yeah, masculine bravada. And what I really appreciated about um, Ben Foster Stanley was that he was, you know, despite the fact that Stanley is like this deeply violent person, he was not afraid to explore like Stanley's vulnerabilities and how those actually propel the violence that he perpetrates, which again is not like to excuse it or authorize it, but to like actually understand that most people are not like violent in a vacuum, that violence Mm -hmm. is produced by things. And he really like went into why is Stanley this kind of like violent, toxic man. Um, So yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, once again, I have other thoughts on Ben (laughs) Foster. I'm saving it because we're not going to jump ahead. But I will say mine goes out to Corey Johnson as Harold Mitchell. Uh, or Mitch, as he's known as in the show. Because uh, mm-hmm. he was great. 
once again, this was uh, that um, Corey Johnson. He's a big man, and he and he felt, and, and yet even though he felt big, he made himself feel small and put upon. You mm. never, I never felt like he owned any space he was in. He always felt out of place, out of step with this production in the right way, because there are there's out of step as in you're missing your cues and you're not lining up with anybody else. But he was lining up with people, but it, he just always felt off by a beat. And it was the perfect offbeat to everybody else. Because once again, he's the nice guy in this tumultuous world who is just looking for a partner. And unfortunately, he, he, he connects with Blanche, who takes him for a very tragic ride and kind of breaks him by the end. Um, and just the pain he brought into that final confrontation between Blanche and Mitch was just painful. It, it was just so sad to see these two lost souls just unable to connect when you're like, actually, you guys could actually make a decent couple if Blanche just dropped her act and just was honest with him and and didn't put on theatricalities to try and woo him. Because I don't think Mitch is a guy who needs theatricality. He just needs someone who will listen and be kind to him and kind of mother him in a way. Like he also kind of needs a bit of a motherly figure as well. But yeah, for me, I just went, the, like once again, like this is, this is a very easy role to mess up where it's just, where 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 he he can also he can also become like Brad Garrett and everybody loves Raymond like the Eeyore uh, of the show that's just oh woe is me all the time and there's no love no heart in him he's just kind of a one dimensional nice guy put upon but there was more to him in this there was there was an act he really charted Mitch's journey throughout the piece where he gets a little bit of confidence with Blanche and then ultimately by the end it crumbles again it's it was a beautiful tragic arc that you see play out in this it was really well done so. Shout out to you, Corey. We'll, we'll, we'll get more into that character and all the others in a bit. But let's get into what is probably going to be probably our past section. So I'm pretty sure we'll all have the same answer to this, which is what was your favorite production or design element? On the count of three, let's all say the same thing. One, two, three. The set. The spinning the set. The set that goes around. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. So we're all yeah. in the same boat with this. Yes. Meg to Willie's set. So Patrick, yes. you can lead us in in our dissection of this beautiful piece of theatrical work here. Yeah. I mean, there's so many elements that you could discuss, like the brilliance of the decision to spin the apartment, to spin mm -hmm. um, the set. Obviously, the video itself actually kind of tells you like the first thematic choice when during the intermission, it goes, the set starts spinning when Blanche takes her first drink. And <laughs> you're like, thank you, National Theater Live. Um, but yeah, so, they knew, um, they knew. Yeah, yeah. So that it like obviously makes us think through Blanche's alcohol use as something that sets into motion these series of events, but also just the way Blanche's presence throws into crisis, the idea of the stability of this home and all the things that unfold from that. Um, the only thing I'll touch on, because I'm sure everyone wants to like, we could talk like I think it's so brilliant, but I, I I also thought a lot about it as like what an incredible set for the actors themselves to get to like play mm -hmm. with and use, and how like the disorientation of the experience could could be something you could harness in such an interesting way, and it would it would be literally impossible to extricate that from the performances all of them are doing, um, and so like just even on a on, on the level of like for the actors, like, I think that would be such an incredible space to work with for these characters who are so unhinged and disoriented. Um, but yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Carly? Yeah, jumping off actually what Patrick said, for me, the word that I thought of a lot when I kept looking at the set was playground. Is mm -hmm. it, it's, it's like, there's so many, like, mm -hmm weird levels and no walls or there's a door you know there's like so many things to play with and it's so fun but I also another thing I thought about it was um not only because it's fun but the way that it looked made it very unsettling as an audience member which was perfect for this show um it put you right off the get like where are we what are we doing mm -hmm. um because if we're like for like a rundown or like poor apartment, essentially. It was this interesting sterile box that mm -hmm. then spun. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really interesting to see how that all came together. And it, yeah, I, I also said this a little earlier to Patrick. It kind of felt like when you <laughs> looked at it, that it was 
like a set of a house built by aliens who had never seen a house before in a good way um for me um because it put you in a place where you're like what like what's what um but then it made sense as it kind of unfolded and they um not dressed it up as they went but like lived in it it came more lived in as Mm -hmm. the show was lived in which i thought was really cool yeah love that andrew yeah, I'm, I can talk forever about the set because that was like literally the first note I made is that how much I enjoyed the set. Um, the, I love the, the bareness of it in that it was there were absolutely no walls. Um, a little like not a criticism, but something I noticed. And like sometimes it looked like they were talking through the walls like they could see each other. And I'm like, mm-hmm. uh, OK, but I accept it's it's hard not to accept it because it was just so captivating and clever because I'm I've never done theater in the room. And the, just the concept of performing in a theater around where you have to be aware of an audience around you all time and not deprive them of a, of a performance is it's all mind boggling to me. So the fact that it not only revolved, but it was completely see through without lacking that complexity mm-hmm. of a house um, and even inviting the audience into like the the privacy of like the bathroom or the be- mm-hmm. of the bedroom, I just thought was so cleverly done. And really just lent itself so nicely to even like the lighting design and the blocking. Mm-hmm. So like, mm-hmm. absolutely, Carly, I, I agree with you as a playground as well, just for the actors. I couldn't imagine the, how fun it would be to explore what somebody could do and how someone can act within that space, especially mm-hmm. knowing that you're in this chaotic spin all the time. Mm-hmm. And I thought they used that element really nicely, the, the spinning aspect of the set, because I find, at least I thought I found, uh, the National Theater likes to make use of their, um, but it was it was the Vic Theater, though, wasn't it? No, National mm-hmm. Vic Theater. Okay. But I, the past uh, National Theater performances that have been streamed live, I've noticed that, ah, we have this set that comes up. We have this set that spins. We can do all these things. And I'm like, okay, you're showing off at this point. <laughs> but this one, Mm-hmm. felt purposeful like the spinning felt very purposeful and mm-hmm. uh as patrick as you had said like they they really made it very clear when at the intermission they're like it starts when blanche i'm like okay thank you for thinking what i was thinking and making it clear <laughs> to me that you're aware but yeah it was just a really really clever practical mm-hmm. set design and i i really appreciated that well, I mean, what else can what else can I say? I mean, the levels are fantastic. The way it reflects how these characters are just stuck turning their wheels versus moving forward in life. They are just stuck spinning on the spot in, in, in this basic chaotic tornado of life was superb. The, once again, the fact that there are these levels in here that, that just allow for this world to feel more developed. Like the fact that we hear Eunice and I forget her husband's name, but the fact we hear their abuse going on upstairs, and it's not just an offstage voice, it's literally upstairs, just makes that world feel lived in and very cinematic in a way, which was wonderful. And the use of that white curtain, that sheer white curtain, was so stunning. It felt like kind of, I mean, people describe uh, like dimension Alzheimer's as like a, a curtain flapping in the wind where there are lucid moments where the person is there, and then there are moments where it's all fog or a haze and there is really nothing behind that curtain. And that to me just reflected that with Blanche and the, every time they pulled that curtain open and closed, it was, it was signifying a change of moment, a change in mental state. So it was just, once again, so many great little details of that, that really made this space feel tangible and real. So yeah. Love it. Love I it. also oh, just, Oh, sorry. Want to shout out the lighting. I thought the mm. lighting was really cool. I just would be sad if we didn't just mention that real quick. Because I thought the like the vignettes between scenes were like like that is what kept for me this uh without getting too ahead of myself, kept this classic contemporary. But yeah, I was like, look at look at all the lights. I thought the lights were really good. Love the light. Because yeah. I, um, I always for me, good lighting is do you just go, wow, that looks amazing, and not just, oh, there were lights? So mm-hmm. That looked amazing. I could see everything. Great lights. Yeah. Agreed. I'm so glad you shouted that out because, like, it. I think the set definitely benefited from from the way the light came in, and it definitely lent itself to being not only there tonally, but like 
it's like a time of day uh, just mm-hmm. kind of representative of the scene and the plot yeah. so yes i'm so appreciative that you that you shout out the lights <laughs> wonderful wonderful let's get into what we thought was the weakest aspect of the production and carly i'll let you start this one because i know what mine's going to be talking about but i'll let other people get ahead before sure. i bring us back to ben foster yeah. Before we all fight. Before we all have a <laughs> smackdown fight. Um, I it's really hard for me because I thought almost every element of this production was really, really strong. I guess the thing for me that wasn't the strongest was just oh, this Libra has to choose. Maybe like I didn't live for Stella. I just didn't live for her. Stella! Um, Stella! But I, it's me, Julie Louise Dreyfus. Stella. Um, no, I just didn't. She's never her. seen that movie, by the way. She never knew about and that quote. She doesn't need to because yeah. she, to me, is the quote. Uh, <laughs> uh, the only person who can pull it off to me is her. Um, but I, no, I just didn't. I wanted so badly to feel so much more for her, but I just couldn't. I just couldn't. I think uh, with Julian Anderson being so strong and uh, with um, Stanley being what I felt also strong, I for me, Stella, I would like just just something else, Stella, or something, not more maybe, but just something, I don't know. I just, to me, maybe that's a good Stella then in this production, because to me, this production centered around Blanche. I mean, the set mm-hmm. literally spun for her. Like, it is yeah. about Blanche. So maybe in this version, Stella is just a vehicle to make the the connection between Blanche and Stanley and the place happen. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm like, I will any opportunity to see a stronger woman. I'm like, sign me up. Because to me, that's Mm -hmm. like what femme folks are like. But I just I felt like something was missing. I don't know what. Um, I think it's Vanessa Kirby because she's a very strong person, a very strong actress. Yeah. She often plays very strong characters. Like her Princess Margaret, as much as there is vulner- um, vulnerability in her performance, she's still a very strong, feisty character in that Mission Impossible. She's strong and feisty, play, play playing like an arms dealer sister, that type of thing. Like she plays very strong women. Who mm-hmm. and Stella for me is someone who is she's strong, but she's not Vanessa Kirby strong. It's a different type of internal strength. Vanessa Kirby it, yeah. it exudes. A strength and a power, very much like Gillian Anderson does. Um, so, well, but see, me, I, I didn't see that strength. That mm-hmm. is maybe some of the strength I would have preferred to see in Stella. Ah, um, okay. Would have shown that to me that like sisterly fight, that sisterly bond, right? Because we like as much as we know Blanche is a fighter and a struggler, yeah. we know that Stella is too. She wouldn't be fighting for herself and fighting for her marriage and fighting for herself every day mm-hmm. in this situation were she not. And I think maybe for me, I just like I could see the love between her and Stanley. That was very mm-hmm. clear. I was like, great. But what else is there? To me, there has to be something else. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's just because I that's my expectation coming into the show, knowing it. Mm-hmm. But I just felt like I just wanted another little glimmer into her, just more yeah. into her. And I just didn't get it, maybe. Yeah. Patrick. Yeah, I feel like I have so The thing I will mostly also talk about is I too did not like Vanessa Kirby Stella, but I do have a small, like a small moment that really was my least favorite part of the production all all along, which is um, in general, I thought the director's decision to use transitions to like basically set new scenes was really interesting and compelling and created really interesting through lines. But the transition before the the first poker game, where it just went hard into like that hard um, like metal rock sound yeah. um, with the hard lighting change. Yeah. I found that very distracting. And I actually think it ended up pulling from the way they really earned those harder um, transitions, like mm-hmm. in the second act, like basically when they used a similar soundscape for um, when Blanche is just fully unraveling and putting on like the tiara and the pink dress. Like that was so, that's, they used a very similar sonic kind of, ambiance for that moment and that was so much more earned and I felt like it was undercut by like this premature use so soon on yeah. um in act one but that's ultimately a very small pedantic critique um yeah my bigger issue is I too found the Stella really underwhelming um and I think this is in part 
like Stella gets as a character gets displaced in this production by the centrality of Blanche and then also the really kind of interesting interrogation of the psychosexual like violence and tension between Blanche and Stanley Mm -hmm. um and so in order to like emphasize or insist on that like you lose a lot of I think nest in- inherently a lot of the complexity of Stella um and I don't know exactly how to pro- properly balance that out like I don't know how much I can say this is like the actor how much this is the director how much this is the staging but I think I think there absolutely could have been opportunities to enrich that character without losing that kind of really interesting um mm-hmm central thing this piece was already interrogating like what would have happened if we actually got to see stella's reactions to her name being screamed right so that we get are given some context for why she goes back to her abuser like i don't know just even small things Mm -hmm. that maybe could could have enriched that performance enriched at least my reception to it because yeah i too like carly was like i want to be more devastated by the position you're in because the position you're in is devastating and I'm just finding that I'm more devastated by everything else. And you're just there. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> this is the one where I was like, I don't know if I actually have an answer for this. I have like a small one, but this one, like I, I was hard to say out of such a, like a strong production, what I felt was the weakest. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have to thank Carly and Patrick though. Both of you brought bringing up Stella and like that, wanting more i hadn't thought of that but now as you as both of you are are kind of like listing what you expected of stella as a character i'm kind of piecing together in my mind oh yeah that would have been interesting that would have been cool um i'm coming at it never seeing a previous version um only knowing like bits and pieces of a streetcar named desire so i don't i don't have any other uh kind of basis to pull from but even just listening to what you both have suggested i'm like yes okay i can see why that would that would bother bother you and why that would pull from Stella's character. I have to say though, on just this is basic look and it's really small and maybe it was purposeful. The thing that kept drawing me out of the performance was like the props because there were just bits and pieces of like this. I didn't know when the play took place because the the set and costumes gave me one, except for when Ben Foster was in his underwear. I'm like, that looks like a modern brand anyway. But like the the, the set uh, and and uh, costumes gave me the impression that it was an earlier time. But then Heineken came in and a modern Coke bottle came in, and I'm like, but they're still using the wire like the a landline wireless telephone. And I'm like, where are we? And also like, again, this is really small, but like having a shiny Coke can in a mostly like matte set i was just kind of drawn to it i'm like oh don't look at the can don't look at the can (laughs) Um, (laughs) which is really small but i it did pull for me because at at one point during the performance i was watching i'm like coke cans 1950s and i was like that doesn't look the same what just happened oh rewind 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 so (laughs) for me just kind of going through that um I kind of had to say, I didn't know if that was purposeful or what they were going for with that. But for me, it just kind of pulled. So I had to go That's I didn't love that. If it was more time appropriate, whatever the time was, I think I would have been more accepting and less distracted. So for me, that it has to go to the kind of the prop choice as weakest element of the production. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. All right. So mine was Mr. Stanley by Ben Foster. Uh, this performance just what? Just, <laughs> I know. This for me just lacks subtlety and nuance that that would that takes this character to the next level for me. Like I never felt Stanley's pain when he's called a pig or an ape or is assaulted about his Polish background. I always just felt angry. And the moments where he bursts out and breaks the radio or does something really abusive and angry, it just felt like oh, now I'm at that point in my blocking. Or I have to do this. I didn't feel the switch or the change and I didn't feel the... the, uh, the when, when you read the script for this, Stanley actually has a lot of dark humor in this. And there is a sinister charm to him that's almost kind of like the devil on your shoulder that's going to bring Stella back and all these people from his bowling league and from work into him. He He is the bad boy on the playground that as much as you all hate him, you really like the guy. 
But for me, I'm just like, I never felt any type of connection to him in the sense of that I want to follow or, or, or I want to hang out with him. Like for me, I just felt, okay, he's here. And I, I mean, it, I mean, could it, maybe it was the costume design, maybe it was just his choice of vocal or vocalizing where he tells he was yelling a lot. Uh, it just, for me, it just felt kind of, it wasn't a bad performance. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't a bad performance, but it, it was just kind of very one note. I didn't feel the charm. I, 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 that's the scary thing about abuse is that it's tactical. Like I, 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 for, I, I, for every action that he does that's horrible, he somehow was able to convince Stella to come back. Like uh, the fact that he takes the radio and goes to get it repaired. That should have been an endearing moment that he does that. The way he picked up that radio and looked at it with such disdain and just, all right, let me go fix it. Like, I, I didn't feel the full breadth of him. And I mean, just at the end, uh, like that whole ending scene where, 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 they're, where they're carting Blanche off to, to the ward there is such a complex scene for Stanley to play. Like on one hand, there's a glee in him that he's won and that he's getting rid of Blanche. Other hand, there's there's shame and pain of what he did to her, and I just didn't feel any of that. And I just want and I, I wanted more from this performance. I wanted something scarier in the sense of subtlety can be scary, and this performance lacked the subtlety and the charm that I think another uh, another perspective of this performance could bring. That's end of, end of discussion. I see Andrew nodding. I see Patrick shaking his head. I see Car. Carly smirking, so I'm like, I, I I'm ready to hear it all come back at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's I feel like it's almost hard to respond to because I'm like I I guess this is where you get to like the like certain subjective level of how people receive performances because I'm like all I saw was nuance, all I saw <laughs> was emotional complexity all driving the joy of- anger. Like this, like the scene you bring up, right? When he's hearing Blanche say all of these horrible things about him. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously the staging wants this to be a joke. Yes. And and so like first and foremost, clearly like they want this to be a joke and it's an effective joke. Yeah. Um, but still I felt like he got like the 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 like, kind of level of I don't know what the right word is for this kind of like empty melancholy when he like, like closes, kind of decides he's gonna, yeah when he decides he's gonna close the door pretend he didn't hear anything and then come back in and puts on this big like this yeah. this bigness mm-hmm. I was like oh this is devastating mm-hmm. um, yeah so, like I'm just like I don't even know I, I don't know if, if if we could even like usefully disagree here because <laughs> I was just listening and I was like I I feel like we watched something different. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of agree. With, I totally agree, actually, with you, Patrick, obviously, um, because of what we said earlier. But yep. I also feel like, yeah, that moment of Stanley standing in the doorway as they're talking about him. He looks like a lost little kid who walked into his parents fighting or talking about his bad grades or talking about how he'll never amount to anything. And he decides, I'm going to remove myself from the situation. But then in the hallway decides, no, I'm confronting the situation and puts on this big thing and the show because that's all he knows how to get attention with mm-hmm. is like this bigness, this bravado, this, mm-hmm. you know, violence. Um, and for me, the radio bit, uh, I loved how it felt like almost like nothing because to me, that's what Stanley does. That he, this is not the first time this has happened. Like everyone knows that this is routine. And for me, that that continued to establish that this is a bad guy. This is just mm. what he does because it's hard for him to deal with anything and that Stella understands that and knows that and loves him regardless. Um, and that's why she's trying to explain to Blanche and Blanche is like, no, that makes no sense. Um, mm. And to me, that made a lot of sense in his choices because he showed that and then we heard it back from Stella. Um, yeah, I also just, I when he hugged Blanche and looked into the audience and, smi- or, and smiled, like, that to me, I literally gasped on the other side of my computer screen, afraid that he would hurt me. And I, I'm, I'm, this is years later. I'm, a, I'm on the other end of the internet. Like, he's not going to hurt me, but he, I was thought he might. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, maybe it is just a different interpretation of what it threatening is to you. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe it's different being in the space, seeing a piece like this. Maybe it's different being removed uh, behind a computer screen. Yeah. And some of that nuance is lost, but mm-hmm. for me, um, yeah, no, I don't agree. <laughs> Andrew? I mean, I definitely, you know, 
for for the other performer that stood out, I said Van Foster for like the various reasons. I mean, I have to agree with Patrick and Carly. It's it's that scene where Stanley's walking in on Blanche just absolutely verbally destroying him. Mm-hmm. And I just felt I felt for Stanley so much because I could just see the thought process of like, I, I'm just taking this. I can't do anything. I don't want to do anything about it. And that thought process of like, what do I do? And just feeling like you're talking to the person I love about how crappy I am. So I just, mm-hmm. and but I, I recognize that this person also loves, loves you. or uh, So I don't know. And I'm just going to walk out. And that, that kind of really set the standard for me of what Stanley was about and that nuance. But I do see what you mean about like, certain elements or certain not elements but certain scenes where there could have been more nuance and could have been uh, it could have been played differently in a more in a less angry less outwardly explicitly violent Mm. and more sinister so while i don't entirely agree i do see your perspective on it and how i think it could be interesting of how that could be played Mm -hmm. i'd like to see your version should you ever direct a version of that and, I'll and have then to get back to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, for me, like, once again, like, once again, like, it's not that he gave a bad performance. Like, once again, he was very captivating. For me, I was just one, le- sometimes less of a sledgehammer, more of the scalpel or, like, the knife between the ribs that mm. makes somebody truly scary when they really want to be scary. Like, uh, uh, that final scene with Blanche and, uh, or that final conversation before the assault. Where, where Blanche has broken the bottle at him and him just, come on, get closer. Like, me, I was like, too much. The scarier thing is just to walk forward slowly and just take the hand and turn it away versus doing the, come on, you know, come at me, that type of thing. I, I, I mean, there's like little moments like that where it's like, what makes things scary, like, like when we watch domestic abuse scenes in a film, Sometimes it's it's more just you're waiting for the explosion to happen. And it's that such that quiet, just pulsing energy of you never know exactly when they're going to explode, but you know that explosion is coming. So you like kind of the the buildup, that menacing kind of Yes. Like at all, 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 all times there, all times there is a scary undertow, but at, there's always this facade of neutrality. There's always this facade of the nice guy that that could easily lead you in, and all of a sudden there's that switch that goes off. Whether it's Blanche says something, Stella does something, the music plays too long at the poker game, something where you, where you, where like you just see a, a a a leg jiggling in its chair, building, building, building until finally, slam, they, the the radio gets broken. Something like that where it where it's just less of a slight once again less of a pleasure, more of the scalpel, more of the knife. Because once again, like I agree, like that scene of him at the door was beautiful and tragic. But then I go like, I need a more mix of that less big because Blanche is already so big that to contrast Blanche, the scariness of Stanley is that quiet, brooding hound dog who can lash out and bite you at any unexpected moment. But when you just touch them the wrong way or you scratch them down the ear at the wrong time, that can make you go, ooh. I don't fully trust you because I don't know what you're going to do. Am, am I getting nice Stanley today? Am I getting mean Stanley today? Any like any of those moments, the unexpectedness that that that, that uh, if you play Stanley right can bring to a role is what makes him like, such a compelling character to me. And that's something I just felt Ben Foster didn't quite nail. Now maybe uh, I, once again I don't know maybe it's part of the costume design as well that they always had in kind of the t-shirts that we see kind of the the sleeveless kind of generic uh, redneck or kind of bad guy t-shirt that that we see in all the movies nowadays where it's like that type of thing where or, or, or he's got the tattoos you know he's kind of he's kind of got the beer can in the hand now could it be some of that direction as well that he, they kind of played into certain personas of someone who's lower income kind of just wallowing maybe that was it i don't know but once again still a very good performance just didn't quite hit its mark as much as i would like it to as someone who's basically playing the male lead of the piece so yeah, all right. Let's get into the next section, which is would we recommend this production to others? Andrew, I'll let you start this one. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, like it's if if we're we're all here kind of like debating about 
what like how strong the performance was and how difficult it is to pick like a weakest piece yeah. of the production um it's it, 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 it's a credit to like how well this production was put together so especially kind of going coming at it having never seen a streetcar named desire in any form this for me was a great starting point to go okay what what do other productions look like are they all this is unfortunately it's a really hard high bar now yes so but knowing that it's a high bar i would definitely go to someone who's like oh you've never seen a streetcar named desire watch watch the young big version mm -hmm. because it's so strong and if it, if it because tennessee williams play is so tense and can be a little intimidating for me to to kind of want to journey into that play i thought this production was a great starting point so i would definitely recommend it to someone wonderful carly um hands down for julian anderson alone like full stop period um but i'll keep going um i i think yeah it, like andrew it's an excellent in into this like titan of american theater it's approachable but interesting it it does like things that you don't expect it to so it is a unique performance mm -hmm. which i think is exciting for a piece like this it gets done all the time <laughs> um or historically has gotten done all the time and it, yeah it brings a an interesting lens that really excited me that it centralized blanche so much mm -hmm. um because a lot of times and the reason that i think i uh, not avoided this play so much for so long but like hadn't really reconsidered it since i was like young i read it when i was like 11 or 12 and i was like i don't like this play very yeah. much because i don't like this man very much like i <laughs> um and then like I, I had seen it or revisited it after that but when i was doing a scene study I was, and i did the scene with the sisters after um the Stella, like the next morning with the sisters i did that scene and i was like this is fun. I like the sisters. I don't like this man. Um, and if you don't like that man, this is a great version for you um, because it's central. It centralizes Blanche so much, and uh, really dives into to that nuance. So hell yeah, see the show. Why not? Love it, Patrick. Yeah, I uh, I fear for my reputation as a hater because you keep putting me on reviews for shows that I like. And I don't like most things. Um, but yes, I do am a like unqualified recommendation. Um, I guess the only qualification would just be for people that don't like to be de like absolutely devastated by things. Because, you know, the the back half of this show is just it, it starts it starts dark and just gets darker. Um, but uh um, but yeah, no, the performance is incredible. The production is incredible. I also think, yeah, like what both um, Andrew and Carly have been saying, I also think this is a very like, like accessible production in the sense of like, you know, you don't have to be into theater to like watch this and feel like it's speaking to you. Um, and even though it's a, it's a classic, like it does such a good job of like, from everything from, I mean, like Andrew also commented on this in like a negative way, but the strange anachronism of like the the set, but also there's a part of that too that makes it feel like you're there's not this sense of like intense like oh like it's important because it's old, um that can be done with like when classic theater is um is reattended to, but instead it's very much it's like the point of this revival is to speak to us now. Um, and so I think it's just a really good inroad for literally, like, yeah, anyone irrespective of, you know, their own interest in theater or not, um, or in Tennessee Williams or not. So yeah, huge, huge recommendation. Yeah, I mean, once again, I also recommend it as much as I was well, was a critiquing Ben Foster, I still highly recommend this production for Ben Foster, Vanessa Kirby, and Jillian Anderson. I mean, the, and uh, C Corey Johnson. Those four make such a, a terrific ensemble piece of pain and suffering that these people go through. It's beautiful and tragic to watch. So I highly recommend it to watch. To watch it. I mean, I know a lot of people know the Marlon Brando movie. Like, like, like the minute I I told my parents I was doing this on Monday, the first thing I, I um at, out of my dad's mouth after the word Stella was oh yeah marlon brando 
And I was like, yes, that one. <laughs> so the, the fact that many people have seen the film, but maybe haven't had a chance to watch a pro shot of the stage version, I, I would totally bring them in to see this. I mean, is it a little long at times? Do, do the transitions sometimes go on a little bit too long? We could appreciate maybe five, seven, ten minutes off this three hour piece. Sure. But overall, fantastic. But once again, you feel the heat. You feel the desperation. You feel the, the rudderlessness of this cast stuck in this apartment. And the timeless quality of this piece, the themes and the characters are timeless in the sense that, and, we'll, and I'll get into this more when we get into the next section, but there's a timeless quality to this play uh, that just speaks to every generation because every generation has to face something like this. Uh, not every person does, but certainly there are many situations in every generation that end up like the Stellas, like like the Blanches, like um, like, like the Stanleys, like the Mitches of the world. Th those people still exist. There are still characterized elements of these people that are still out there that people can connect with. So this play, even though it was written over uh, back in the 50s, or I, I think it was the 50s that this play came out, the 50s after, yeah, because Marlon Brando started it on Broadway and then went over to the movie. Yeah, so it was 50s. Like, it still works. It still speaks today. So yeah, absolutely. Put it on your watch list. Highly recommend. I mean, I mean, if you're a fan of The Crown, you got two stars from The Crown right in the titles, characters there with uh, Blanche and Stella. So get in there, watch them. So yeah. All right. Let's get into the next section, which is our more play textual based questions. So all four of the main characters, Blanche, Stella, Stanley, and Mitch are richly drawn with complex plot lines, backstories, and struggles. Which of the four would you say you most identify and empathize with while watching this play? Carly, I'll let you start this one. Um, I, this, this might be a lot, but I identify with Blanche a lot. She puts on a show, she convinces herself of things that are not true, and then she tries to convince everyone around herself, and she likes to be fancier than she is, and I, what I most identify with is, is that. But also, like, sometimes it's hard to be honest with yourself, and she's mm -hmm. someone who's never honest with herself. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I have been working on for myself is to be more honest for myself and to myself. Um, because sometimes it is easier just to lie to yourself and to everyone around you uh, that everything's fine. Everything's really good. Everything's fine. I'm amazing. Look how rich I am. Uh, but you really, none of it is true. And it, the bottom will fall out. So um, like Blanche is somebody who uh, is fighting to survive. And I think a lot of folks can relate to that. She's also somebody who her circumstance is a lot. And she's someone who tries her best to deal through it. And all considering she does pretty okay until she's pushed to, you know, the edge, not really being okay all the way. And especially like I like to consider the time when this show originally was as well. She is kind of brought up in this world that doesn't exist. Like she's the Southern Belle uh, in the like late 40s, early 50s. Um, she's had to rely on her family estate and all the men in her life to get her through. And they all let her down in different ways. And she um, is taught that that's the only thing she can rely on is that and her beauty and being a woman. That's what it is. And so it's easy to villainize her. But I think this production specifically does a really good job of showing that she's a person who's doing her best to cope. And I think, especially the last few years, we can all relate to that. Just trying to cope the best we can. Maybe we don't come out unscathed. Maybe we don't come out great. But we end up alive. And is that really, like, really sad? Maybe. But yeah, Blanche. For all her fancifulness and all her hardship, for me, it's Blanche every day. All day. Andrew? Did, I kind of cheated with my answer because there were elements of Blanche that I really enjoyed, specifically as Car Carly, as you said, that kind of putting on a brave face and um, making it seem at least outwardly and even to yourself that like you're in a better position than maybe you are. Uh, I think that really speaks to me. But also there was, it was really hard to like pull my heart away from Stella, funny enough. I just, I just felt for Stella. And I know that's not necessarily empathizing or 
um, identifying as, but there was just something that I like, I felt I understood about her character and that um, the, the world is almost kind of, there's a lot about her world I found that was kind of spinning around her without her knowledge. And that also that she was kind of ignoring, especially that kind of toxic relationship, that toxic relationship that she had with her husband. Um, but like, I just, I just kind of go and like, yes, I've, I've, I understand where you kind of like go, I got to ignore that just to kind of get by. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of like, a, there's no control over it. Um, at least that's how I read into Stella's character. So for me, it was kind of a combination of like the putting on of Blanche and the almost ignoring uh, of, of Stella that I kind of identified with. Love that. Love that. Patrick? Yeah, that leads in perfectly actually to my answer because my answer definitely is Stella. Um, so of course, I mean, every actor I think sees themselves to an extent in Blanche uh, for, for the reasons uh, we've already said. But yeah, I mean, obviously, like on a surface level, this is a play about deeply violent forms of relation. But like kind of more abstractly, it's a play about like the uses of fantasy right? Blanche who like uses fantasy to survive her quotidian suffering, but actually very astutely responds to moments of crisis. Um, except when she's like literally too drunk, she's incapacitated, right? But like, it's not for nothing that Blanche tells Stella that Stanley raped her, um, right? Like that is significant that, that, that she does not gloss that with fantasy. It's not for nothing that she constantly tells Stella this relationship is hurting you, that she doesn't couch that in fantasy. Um, whereas Stella is really pulled into like the realism of Stanley, but she, as you were saying, Andrew, she actually, she uses fantasy to ignore that, which is most violent to her. And so she, um, and in a way that she is not realizing that she uses fantasy, right? Like that horrifying, horrifying, tragic line at the end when she's talking to Eunice and Eunice just says, you can't believe her story because if you believe her story, because you need to go on living. So that is what it is, right? Like there's actually no, there, there's no uh, disavowal of what happened, but just this active choice to move on as if nothing happened. And I think that's like, uh, we're living in like, a generation, we're like a generation of Stella's, like the structural conditions of the world are so fucked and like, it's impossible to stay with that suffering or confront that suffering. And we're always like deflecting, deflecting um, because it's super fucking painful. And that's what I keep saying fucking, I forget. I think they're going to beat me, but anyway, um, and that's, but that's what Stella does. Um, and yeah, that is deeply relatable this tendency to um, disavow, disavow, push down the things that you know hurt you, but then pretend you live in this like actual realistic box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, my choice was Mitch. I identify most, most with poor Mitch. I mean, I'm not six feet tall, but I am often described as the softer friend who is often heavier set, who has little to no luck in romance. So this pained guy, I was like, I get you, Mitch. I get this, what put upon this that, that you feel in this piece. I totally feel for you as the nice guy of the story who gets caught up in this unwanted whirlwind. Um, so I was like, I totally get it. And I totally just felt his pain and his anger at the end that I was like, yep, I would be upset and pissed off too, Mitch. I get you. I get this character. I, I I I get the guy who's always the butt of the joke in the friend group. I was like, yep, I get this. I get you, Mitch. So for me, I'm like, yeah, Mitch. M M M Mitch just felt like such a human character to me that I was like, yeah, I get you. I get you. So Mitch, shout out to you, Mitch. Go. There's Carly, one go. other that I uh, forgot to mention that I relate to even more than Blanche and that would be uh Blanche's wardrobe crumpled in her suitcase on the floor until the till she leaves. Mm -hmm. Um that's also to me the most relatable. I was like, I I get that. That's a that's a mood. So. Love that. Love that. All right. Next question, which is the nineteen fifty film adaptation of Streetcar famously needed to change the ending to appease the censors of the time. 
consequently ending with Stella deciding to leave Stanley uh, after what he did to Blanche. What are your thoughts on this alternative ending? How does slash would it change your view of everything that comes before it? Patrick. Yeah, Nick's cancel. No. Censorship has no place in art for obvious reasons. And yeah, that is such a boring choice at best and a choice that goes against the things Williams is exploring at worst for the reasons that I just said, actually. So I feel like I can kind of like, for TLDR, go back to what I was saying about Stella. <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense for Stella to do that. That's not, and nothing has happened that um, justifies that shift. That shift only happens, yeah, to please the censors in the movie version. And that's absurd and get censorship out of art. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Andrew? Um, I also couldn't see it had happening. Um, I definitely like, again, I haven't seen the movie, but knowing that that's how the movie ends, I can kind of see myself going, oh, thank goodness. Oh, <laughs> yes. That's it. like, I can totally feel how much relief I would get at everything that happened before, knowing that it culminated in this quote unquote happy ending where um, Stella escapes. Uh, and gets the agency to go i'm 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 out of here enough of this i'm not gonna live in this as you said patrick fantasy anymore at the same time the play's not written like that mm -hmm. and it's not it's not supposed to end that way it's supposed to end in this horribly uncomfortable situation because it for me it just feels more uh sadly to say it feels more uh like like a reflection of the way it goes sometimes mm -hmm. and having it end in a comfortable way just kind of makes everything that happened before kind of feel like yeah okay that but but it ended okay but it's fine whereas i almost feel the the intention was like it's not there are these terrible things that happen in life there are these terrible things that happen to these people and the fallout is much worse yeah um Mm -hmm. So, so having that that nice kind of happy ending that the censorship um, kind of demanded for the film, again, would feel better as an audience uh, audience member, but also isn't it doesn't give the audience any credit for being able to go. I have to sit with that discomfort and acknowledge it and mm -hmm. feel it, and it's a much stronger choice. Again, Patrick, as you had said, it's mm -hmm. definitely. Um, I think the intent, the, the reason. Um, Tennessee Williams wrote it like that and how it should have stayed. So especially having seen this version where that's the, now going to be the version that I will forever know is how it should be. It's going to be really hard to swallow, even though it's a happier ending. Yeah. Yeah. I backpack that really oh, yeah. quickly. Yeah. yeah Cause uh, yeah, you're just making me think like, I often think this is going to sound super provocative. Like the worst thing to happen to art is narrative. Like the notion that we go from crisis to resolution and we end on resolution, like narrative arc is just so untrue of the world we live in. Um, and like you say, it's like really, um, it feels really fulfilling a lot of the time as an audience member because it's clean or as a person taking something in. But I'm like, I'm always, I'm interested in what, how art is used and the uses of art. And I feel like, you know, as Williams intended, this was like a provocation to sit with the problem of like violent relation mm -hmm. um, and go like, there's no easy out. There's, this is a problem without a coherent solution, you know? And so there cannot be a coherent solution. She can't just leave. Um, and so like, yeah, there's this like, this turn to resolution, I'm just in general deeply suspect of. And so like this kind of obviously intensely plays out in this movie version. Yeah. Carly, I deeply agree. It's a dumb, dumb, dummy of an ending. Um, <laughs> like, are like a, a piece like this is not meant to like create a comfortable space for the audience. You're mm. supposed to be provoked. You're supposed to feel upset. You're supposed to feel enraged. You're supposed to feel a lot of different feelings. What what you're not supposed to feel is comfortable. Uh, you're supposed to be, feel safe as an audience member. You should feel good to go to the theater and good to leave. Um, but you shouldn't feel comfortable or complacent. Um, and this is a piece that does it very well. And so, yeah, to be like, the only reason we need a different ending is because we don't like it because it's not mm, a good time. is not a good enough reason. 
Uh, never is. So it also like, it does a huge disservice to yeah folks who who live in the real world, folks who experience abuse at various levels. Um, it is not healthy to have to want to put a bow on everything, um, like Stella does. Like that. Like this is not good. Like it's like pretending it doesn't. Like by making it better, it pretends that it's fine and it was never fine. So just sit with that. Um, I think it's easy to choose to make it all picture perfect like we're so inclined to as a society but art's not meant necessarily meant to do that um mm -hmm. and this show especially doesn't do that and so it shouldn't do that yeah, yeah. dumb dumb dummy of an idea period yeah for me i go this alternative ending is certainly more optimistic and happy but once again i go in the time period of the 1950s stella leaving was a very rare if ever an occurrence that goes in the face of what happens in the 1950s and how a wife leaving a husband, no matter how abusive he was, was shamed upon by society, especially a woman now with a baby. Like that is even more of a reason to have her stay, unfortunately. Well, sadly so. She also can't open a bank account. It's the yeah. 50s. He would exactly. stay with her family to yeah. raise her child out of necessity. Like, it's also just not dumb. Like, it, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense. Right. It makes sense solely to redeem Stanley and for no one else. And why is Stanley the person that we're focusing on redeeming here? That's a problem. Like, no, that's not. No, no. Dumb, yeah. dumb, dummy. That's an idea. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I mean, Carly, you said it. Like, unfortunately, this, uh, the, the, this, the situations of Stella and Stanley is still very much a real world situation and this play plays that way i mean the fact that this play was timeless in the sense you couldn't quite pin down a time period just shows how these themes these messages these situations ex expand time itself there is no 1950 only this is the situation we found in that time it's like no no you you could do it today i mean i mean there are elements of a standing situation happening now with dare i say kanye west and kim kardashian that you're just kind of like, ooh, I'm not fully feeling you with like this is a dangerous situation that people are not fully getting out, get, getting get, figuring out, and it's scary. And that's the thing where they were like, this play is about sitting in the uncomfortability of the real world and going, look, here's the mirror. That like that's what great art does is it holds the mirror up to this to society and goes, look at what is happening. I mean, the Crucible, classic, easy example of. Joe McCarthy's Red Scare trials being being personified by Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, going, look, see, nothing's changed. We still persecute, we still witch on people. Nothing's changed. This is still very much the same thing of, hey, these situations, these Stellas, these Stanleys, these Blanches still happen. Like, even if we're not dragging people off to sanatoriums like they do to Blanche at the end, because we've moved a little bit further than that, thank God. But still, I mean, I mean, we're still in the age of heavily medicate people, heavily quiet them in some way. Uh, I, I mean, it's still like not believing when somebody says this happened to me. People are going, no, no, it couldn't happen. No, because it makes it easier for the other person to deny, deny, deny versus accept the truth and the reality of, of, of the situation. Right. I mean, that's how some people get away with it for so long because they're like, no, 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 he's a nice guy. How could Bill Cosby do something like that? He is. The Disney Dr. Huxtable dad. Come on now. No. You know, really, everyone's like, no, no. Bad guy, bad guy, horrible person. Not good. Um, so it's scary and it's sad in that way that this place still is so relevant. And the fact that you changed the ending to leave the audience going, oh, good, she got out. It's like, no, no. The, the scarier and sad thing is that majority of the time, it doesn't happen that way. And that is why that piece needs to stay the ending it needs to stay as in the play because when you leave that show you should come out going damn how is it we haven't changed since the 1950s how is it we are still having these issues and these problems how is it that we're not more further along and more ahead and, and, and more and more progressive in the sense of changing the system and changing the society that allows this to happen how are we still in the same turntable still going around that we haven't actually progressed the wheel further ahead and still stuck in the same rut. So yeah, no, the, the ending totally doesn't work. It doesn't make sense historically, 
thematically, it just totally was created to, for the sense of the film, which is why I think there should be a remake of the film. But yeah, no, it just totally doesn't work on any level. It doesn't make any sense, but I would totally love to see a film remake of Streetcar. Like, I think it, it, this play warrants a new adaptation. There are a, a new cast of people to step into this role. Like, this is a juicy, juicy play that could easily do it well. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's, but do it with the original ending. There's the caveat. Do the movie, do the do the remake with the proper ending, and see how audiences feel at the end of that. So, yeah. All right. Let's get into the last question, which is, and I think we kind of already kind of answered this question, but this play is widely considered to be uh, one of the masterpieces of the American and global dramatic canon. Can or do you think it is worthy of the high praise and cultural currency that has been bestowed upon it? Does it still uh, hold up? so many decades later andrew i have to say yes but i also have to say yes but oh. um because i having I, I think it took me to the end to go yes okay now i see why um it stood up and it is for that funny enough it was for that ending where everything is not resolved and how these characters have been built up, built up, built up, and then their situation doesn't change and it goes on being terrible. And I kind of go, it's it, it it's scary how, it's scary and sad, like how relatable certain characters are to still like people today. And for that reason, I can kind of see why it's held up for so long for uh, 60 plus years, I think it is, if I'm mathing correctly. I may not be, but I can see why. Folk. Yeah, exactly. I don't need to know math. I'm not a set builder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, for that reason, I can see why it's held up for so long. My butt is, I think it's really just kind of in the dialogue for me. Um, I'm not accustomed to these kind of like long winded plays. Um, and that's that that could really just be kind of like a personal thing. But like one of the things I was very observant of is like, wow, I don't really see plays that have characters that go on for chunks and chunks and chunks of dialogue. And and I go, I can tell more or less when it was written based on how mm -hmm. that structure came from. Mm -hmm. So does it hold up? Yes. But can I tell the the era in which it was written? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um so would it would it be mistaken for something that was written today? No, but are the characters still relatable today? A hundred percent. Well said, well said, Patrick. I see you nodding. Yeah, yeah, no, I uh, I totally agree that like I mean in general, kind of the the style of writing, like didactic theater, isn't really a thing anymore. Which a low key, I'm like that's a loss. I want to bring that back. Bring back, back long winded um, <laughs> <laughs> dialogue. But uh, but yeah, no, absolutely agree with like everything you just said about placing it. But yeah, uh, um, yeah, I I think I mean the C feels almost weird to say. Carly and I were actually talking about this um, earlier, but uh, like I feel like in as much as someone like Tennessee Williams could be underrated, I actually think Tennessee Williams is underrated. Like I think like no one for me in the American um theater canon uh had, writes more devastatingly complex characters um and like you know streetcar is one of those plays where he's just at like the height of like that skill of just kind of like giving us the most rich complex people whose issues are constantly hitting each other in ways that will not like jive and i think that's always going to be relevant for people um and kind of the i use this word very sparingly but dare i say the authenticity and i hate that word but the authenticity of the kind of like fissures he's able to like bring out of this are just like horribly difficult to watch and incredibly necessary to watch so yeah absolutely holds up carly out of 10, uh, both agree with Andrew and Patrick. Absolutely. For me, the way that I know that it holds up is it has the three pillars of contemporary theater. It has abuse, alcoholism, and astrology. So that's how I know it's like that's a mainstay. So still relevant, still important. Um, no, I joke, I joke. But also, <laughs> I mean, relevant. Um, no, I, I also just think that it like, I it's something that I you just, 
you watch it and you go, I see why this is how it is. And I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon, nor should it. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many ways, even though, yes, it's long-winded. And maybe long-windedness needs to come back into style because I'm very long-winded. And life is long-winded. So let's do that again. Um, but I agree that's not like a contemporary style of, yeah. of uh, what we're expecting. We just have such short attention spans. But I think this production does an excellent job of, of taking a classic and keeping it current and ke making it feel fresh and keeping folks engaged. And I think that's what we need when we watch the classics currently. Um, otherwise, the classics will go away. Um, but this is not one of them that I think will. Even if you go see a bad TV theater production of it where it's everyone is under 12 and uh, you, you, they did a scene study of it and then the one girl will never care about it again because she doesn't like the, the weird man. Um, <laughs> it never happens. It never happened. I only did it in Saturday theater school. So, but yeah, I think it's just, yes. Yes. How could it not? Mm-hmm. Love that. Love that. I mean, for me, I go, this piece is a mammoth uh, marathon of a piece. Like, whoever you do get for this, they got to be a Olympian level shape of a person to mentally, physically do this three hour piece. And the characters are still so compelling and warrant revisits time and time again. I mean, Blanche Dubois is someone who is a character that every generation, every few years, we will keep seeing it because there's always an actress who wants to play. It's kind of like Mama Rose in, in Gypsy, where every few years, every five, six years on Broadway or West End, they're going to do a Gypsy because there's an actress who's now coming to the role and is now ready to take on that performance. Blanche is a similar way where I could see two years from now, maybe because this was, this was 2014. Yeah, 2014, they did this. So, I mean, I can see in two years from now, which is a decade later, another actress gets to come along and play Blanche Dubois again, National Theater of Land, because this is just a piece you can keep coming back to, keep revisiting. You may identify with Blanche in one production, but a director may come in and go, I really want to center Mitch in this. I want to do more scene transitions showing what Mitch is up to, or Eunice is up to, or Stella's up to. I really want to pull focus on them and show kind of how this Roland is affecting other characters. And Tennessee Williams' text is great in the sense that it gives you that breathing room to go. It's not always about Blanche. Like, the fact that we look back at the movie version and everybody remembers Marlon Brando and, and the Stella and his Stanley is more what people remember from the 1950s. Or at least for me, I know when people kind of look, think back on it, it's, it's uh, the Oscar clips and everything always go back to Marlon Brando. We don't see a Blanche clip. It's Marlon Brando in the rain shouting Stella. Now, when you watch this production, you go, oh no, it's Jillian Anderson's show. It's her story that we're following. And that's what's great about this piece is that it, it gets it gets the hand up. Like, I would love to see a production where Stella is given her, her due and is able to get more of a featured presence on stage and is less, in, in more of a driving detail of the story. Um, so, so, so you really get the, the pain at the end of when she makes the choice to turn her back on Blanche the way she does. Um, but yeah, this piece is a benchmarker. And it's one of these pieces that we come back to because it pretty much us to evaluate where we are as a society and reminds us that we still haven't come far enough. Uh, and it's one of those kick in the butts that just go, nope, you're still not there. We're still in the situation. We're still in this world. Go back and go, go back to the grindstone. Keep working it. So, yeah, this piece is, is highly deserving of its praise. Is the text a little dated? Sure, in the sense of it is long winded. There were a few times where I was like, Holy cow, Jillian is going on for a long time. Then I was like, oh, wait, I don't mind her. Oh, wait, no, her accent's not getting on my nerves. Oh, wait, no, wait, she's still really good. Like, <laughs> in five minutes where she's rant, where she's dialoguing, you get all these different thought processes that go through the brain. But it's great. Like, once again, sometimes the old writing is timeless for a reason. Like, so, some of these classics, like the language, like, like Shakespeare, uh, like Arthur Miller, like Tennessee Williams, there is a timeless quality to some of their long-winded writings that just capture the human spirit in such a way that is yet to be captured again sometimes by modern playwrights that are we're still trying to find these people that, that will that will come, join the pantheon of, uh, of of the greats that we have already up on our shelves so but yeah this is a piece i'll keep coming back because you can keep reevaluating, keep re-exploring so yeah it still it still holds up in many ways so yeah 
that's that. Wow, everybody, we did it. We made it through in less time than it took us to watch the play. So yay on that. We're, we're under the three-hour mark. All right. So before we all go, let's all plug our socials and stuff. Carly, I'll let you kick us off for this. Sure. Um, you can find me anywhere on the internet as at Ms. Carly Billings. Uh, if you want to check out what Patrick and I are up to as a theatrical duo, you can check out Afterlife Theater. And you can find us also on the internet pretty much anywhere. You just press in the little Google machine. You're good to go. Love it. Love it. Patrick? Um, yeah, you can uh, follow me on Instagram at PostmodernPat. I am not a postmodernist. I just think it's a funny handle. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Patrick Michael T, but that's like largely where I just do like very esoteric academic posts where I'm like subtweeting disciplines and stuff. Ah. So that maybe don't follow that one. I follow. Um, unless you're into that. But, uh, <laughs> and then of course, as Carly said, at Afterlife Theater on anything. Love it. Love it. Andrew Rigger, who find follow you and all your performance antics. Uh, if you're interested in what I'm up to, you can find me on Instagram at andrew.s.pwaru. That's andrew.s.p-a-w-a-r-r-o-o. Good, good. Thank you for spelling that. Thank you for spelling that. Uh, and you can find follow me at Mackenzie Warner on social media platforms. You can follow my other venture, which is Before the Downbeat, a musical podcast where we break down musicals on a bi-weekly basis. So coming up, we have our episodes on Legally Blonde. My Fair Lady in Greece. So tune in, check those out. Because uh, I don't know when exactly this will be coming out. So when it comes out, you can check on out before the downbeat, see what's coming around. That's that on that front. Uh, check out, be sure to check out all our other videos, whether it's Carly and Patrick's interviews, whether it's one of the many panels Andrew's been on, like Oklahoma Pipeline. He's run the gambit with us. So <laughs> check that. Or, 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 or his famous turn as one of the murderers in, in our Richard the Third scene. Oh, that, that was did. fun. That was a good time. That was a good time. So check it all out. And thank you again, everybody. And if you do want to know where you can watch Julia, Julia Louis Jarvis do a perfect Stella, it, the episode's called The Pen. And it's where Jerry and Elaine go down to Florida for, for a week and they get stuck in Florida. And it's great. And she is superb. I would love to see her play Stanley Kowalski after her turn as Selena Meyer in Veep. I feel she could be a very scary Stanley Kowalski if, if you were to do a cross-gendered uh, version of, of the play, which I think could be a really interesting production. Who knows? I put it out into the ether uh, for, for thought bubbles to, to multiply out there. Either way, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you all in the next episode. Thanks. Bye!